Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Our program will begin in just a moment. Good day. Welcome to Advocacy Anywhere, powered by AJC. Advocacy Anywhere is AJC's new digital platform that will enable you to engage with AJC's global expertise, content, and advocacy from wherever you are. Today's program is brought to you in partnership with Jewish Insider. You can sign up for Jewish Insider's daily kickoff by visiting www.jewishinsider.com. The coronavirus has exacerbated conspiratorial anti-Semitism, which was already on the rise around the world. Joining us to discuss this topic today are Katerina von Schnurbein, who serves as the European Commission Coordinator on Combating Anti-Semitism, Nikita Malik, Director of the Center on Radicalization and Terrorism at the Henry Jackson Society, and Holly Huffnagel, AJC's US Director for Combating Anti-Semitism. Our moderator will be Daniel Schwamenthal, director of AJC's Transatlantic Institute. After we hear from our panel, we will take your questions. You may email your questions to questions, plural, at AJC.org, or use the Q&A feature in Zoom. Daniel, you and our panelists have the floor. Thank you, Ali. It's a great pleasure to be with all of you today for our AJC Advocacy Anywhere program. When I began my job at the Transatlantic Institute in Brussels nine years ago, I was hoping to be able to focus my work on fostering stronger transatlantic and EU-Israel relations. But unfortunately, amid a dramatic rise of anti-Jewish violence and sentiments, we had to dedicate more and more of our resources to combating anti-Semitism. Much the same is true for the American Jewish Committee's six other posts in Europe, and more recently, also for our 22 regional offices in the United States. And given that modern anti-Semitism expresses itself in anti-Zionism, the issue is also directly affecting our work on Israel. With that in mind, I'd like to turn first to Katharina. You became the first European Commission coordinator on combating anti-Semitism five years ago. And maybe a quick explanation, if not everybody might be familiar with the various EU institutions you work for the European Commission, which is like the executive branch of the European Union responsible for proposing and implementing legislation and managing the day-to-day -day business of the EU. Since your appointment, we have worked closely together on a number of initiatives, including the European Parliament's first anti-Semitism resolution, and a year later in 2018, on the EU Council Declaration on Fighting Anti-Semitism. Maybe you can explain to our worldwide audience, what were some of the most important steps the European Commission and member states have undertaken over the past few years to uh, fight anti-Semitism? And what are to come next? Katarina. Yes, hello, Daniel. Hello, everyone. It's a pleasure to be with you. And um, thank you for this excellent cooperation that's been going on uh, over the years. Um, our overall goal uh, is at the European Commission to ensure a future for Jews in Europe. And so what we have tried to do is use all the different means that we have at hand um, to address uh, this issue on a European level. Of course, we've seen, uh, as you've said, uh, a significant rise of different forms of anti-Semitism. We think that all of them are equally pernicious and therefore need to be uh, re rebut and, and treated uh, uh, in an equal uh, way. It's been important uh, to define anti-Semitism and uh, for many uh, of the audience, probably the IRA definition on anti-Semitism uh, will, uh, will be familiar. It is important because it's a non-legislative um, uh, bias indicator of anti-Semitism, but it covers the various forms, including also anti-Zionism and other forms of Israel-related anti-Semitism that, uh, that we've seen uh, significantly on the rise. Um, however, uh, I think that we've also seen in the past um, when it comes to extremism, 
uh, and we know that the attacks um, that we've seen in Europe came from within the Muslim community, but also most recently now uh, in the attack on the Halle synagogue from right-wing extremism. So our focus really is on uh, all the different forms of extremism and how to uh, counter this in close cooperation with, uh, with uh, Europol, with the counterterrorism uh, coordinator. Um, we have uh, legislated on takedown of terrorist content um, where now the platforms are responsible to take down within one hour any terrorist content they detect or upon uh, public order. We have uh, increased our security for places of worship and also um, Jewish community buildings. Um, all of these initiatives have uh, one goal, namely, as I said, to ensure that Jews see their future here uh, in Europe. I think what is important also there is um, that uh, we recognize the Jewish identity. And we've therefore also asked questions in, in a large survey, uh, 16,500 Jews across Europe, um, asking them about their identity here in Europe. And not surprisingly, Holocaust remembrance was the number one uh, identifying factor, but support for Israel was um, only three percentage points lower. And so I think that we have to take this holistic view when it comes to ensuring this future. As you said already, we've uh, passed declarations. We have some legislation already in place when it comes, for example, to take down on, of hate speech online. But what we uh, needed really was also the political commitment, not only of the European Parliament, which was an important resolution, but then also of the EU member states. And they committed now in December 2018 to creating national strategies to combat anti-Semitism in a holistic way and to ensure the security um, of their Jewish communities. Um, we have a very uh, broad view on what needs to be done. Short term, as I already said, with regards to security, but also long term when it comes to education in a holistic way, not only the dark chapters, but also the cultural heritage, the contribution of the Jewish community throughout the centuries, and therefore also understanding why Jews belong uh, to Europe as simply part of our societies, and then what it means if we see anti-Semitism rising again today. So this, this has been um, occupation in the different, on the different layers. I think what is important now and what will be the next um, step is to ensure that this is not only done on European level, which is important, of course, but unless it trickles down and every mayor, every school director understands what needs to happen, there will be no change for the Jewish community. And so this will be the challenge now of the new mandate of the new European um, uh, Commission mandate to ensure that we can work with the member states and through these strategies, ensure that it actually makes a change for uh, the Jewish community. Well, Katarina, you, you mentioned a very important uh, issue, um, online uh, hatred and anti-Semitism and, 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 and terrorism that, you know, that there is uh, an agreement to take down um, uh, illegal content uh, immediately. Now, with the lockdown amid this corona pandemic, the role of social media in spreading uh, anti-Semitism and specifically conspiracy theories accusing Jews and or Israel of being behind the virus take on a particularly dangerous role. And so, so last week, AJC sent a letter to Commission President von der Leyen urging her to address conspiracy theories, suggesting uh, we suggested a number of concrete steps, which we can discuss later on. But what are the chances the Commission will take on this very specific threat and how could it do it? I, be, I fully agree that uh, the conspiracy theories that we are seeing um, in different ways are um, dangerous. Um, they are dangerous not only because they create an atmosphere for the Jewish community that is very unpleasant, um, especially as, as uh, because of the confinement, many are spending more time on the net uh, than, uh, than before, but also because we know that conspiracy myths have translated into attacks. 
in the past. And therefore, um, you know, we need to make sure that this, uh, this uh, does not happen uh, in the future. There are, with regards to different forms of conspiracy, uh, myths also related to COVID already um, uh, platforms in place. Um, we have since 2018, a European strategy on this information, um, where we have on the one side, external monitoring of state-made disinformation and conspiracy myths um, coming from Russia and China. And, um, and I know that there are uh, also talks about uh, including other countries. Um, I mean, I know that one particular concern of the Jewish community is Iran, for example, um, will uh, have a rapid alert system which is cross-border so we can work across member states to ensure that um, this information is immediately detected. Um, and in that context, we've also concluded a code of good practice with the major platforms to ensure that on their side, they um, increase the level of fact checkers, uh, that they, uh, that they uh, can detect fake accounts, take them down, um, we will have a new evaluation now of this whole system after uh, a bit more than a year and to see whether regulation is needed or not. So we are taking this issue very seriously. And I think that, you know, given that we know what conspiracy myths, especially also anti-Semitic conspiracy myths can lead to, this will um, certainly be uh, of importance. And I think that the agency's letter there certainly can also contribute to emphasizing uh, this, uh, this importance. Uh, thank you, Katarina. Um, Ali, you are AJC's director for combating anti-Semitism, and you bring invaluable government experience to the job as you previously worked as a policy advisor to the Special Envoy to Monitor and Combat Anti-Semitism at the U.S. State Department. Uh, we just heard from Katarina about online uh, hatred. Uh, the major online platforms are all headquartered in the United States where we have a minor constitutional issue known as the First Amendment. Does America's strict adherence to free speech mean our hands are tied, at least in the United States? Thank you, Daniel, uh, for the softball question right out of the gate, First Amendment, let's, let's go there. Um, so I think it's important to, to know what the First Amendment says and what it does not say. And I actually think there's confusion even amongst Americans on what it says and, and what it does not say. So I'll try to um, explain that here. Uh, so the First Amendment says that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Okay, but there are categories which are not protected in that. Um, so incitement, for instance, defamation, fraud, obscenity, child pornography, fighting words, and threats to violence um, that are imminent, that's actually not protected under the First Amendment. And we also have to remember that free speech uh, is an individual right. So it's the right of an individual, but there are limitations on that free speech for the greater good. We actually see this with um, preserving the public order, for instance, or protecting other democratic values like equality. So that's one big, big piece right there. The second thing which relates to our conversation today is that the First Amendment applies to the US government creating legislation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't apply to private companies' decisions to create and to follow their own, their own rules. And so, you know, while as a US citizen, the First Amendment gives me the right to access everything, like I have the right to access online platforms on the internet to go search out whatever I, I want, if I post something or say something that goes against like those tech companies' rules, um, it's not a freedom of speech issue. It's actually a corporate responsibility issue for them to you know to clean up or to you know to clean out their their platform. So that's a a big distinction uh, right there. And of course, in the United States, we do have other tools to because of this First Amendment. And I'll just mention one, and we can we can circle back with other ideas. But that's um, the civil society pushback mechanism because we have first amendment and the government can only go so far in limiting um, free speech we have a very strong civil society in the united states and you know we need that social ostracism so if someone says something you know so anti-semitic so odious but it's you know not inciting violence it's technically legal right the government can't do anything about it but civil society can and i'll give one example um 
in 2017, in August, we had the March on Charlottesville, right? The neo-Nazi, the white supremacist March in Charlottesville. A lot of those people were operating online, on, on platform, under this guise of on, um, anonymity, right? They didn't, no one knew really who they were. And then they came out offline and they were very proud of it actually. How, you know, what started online movement became something offline, they're marching, they're showing their colors. However, people took pictures and their, their names came up on the, on the internet and the, some of them lost their jobs. Employers didn't wanna employ white supremacists. They were you know, disavowed and some even disowned from family members and friends when they, they, were, they saw them on, you know, um, on TV and in the newspaper. And that was not the government coming in and saying, you can't do this. You have a right to protest. You have a right to engage in speech. It was that, social, that civil society, um, social ostracism that, that happened. And that's the best practice. So we're not completely uh, helpless even, even with the First Amendment. Right. Um, moving perhaps beyond just uh, the online world, um, what else can, can we do? What else can specifically the United States do? Um, um, since you are the expert there uh, in the post COVID where we um, exit the lockdown and people could actually more easily commit actual violence um, and not right. just on the internet. So I have a few a few things I want to share, and I I do want to say say this because um, today's actually a special anniversary. It's the one year anniversary of the Poway shooting today, mm -hmm. and you know this was of course pre COVID, and you already had instances where people were radicalized online. You know, thinking of the Poway um, killer today on on Eight Chan, you know, in a kind of extremist platform where you know this open racist letter was put out, white genocide theories, etc. So even before COVID, we see. Uh, real life consequences, right? So these conspiracy theories happening online, coming offline and, and killing Jews. And so I think the concern we have now in, in during COVID pandemic is these conspiracy theories are swirling. We know people are seeing them and engaging. What, is that, what does that mean, right? What can we do now to prepare ourselves for a year from now or two years from now? We don't want another Poway, you know, God forbid another Pittsburgh. Like we, how, what, what mechanisms can we put in, in place now? And so, Usually when we talk about best practices on uh, pushing back on, on online hate in the United States, we look at about four or five areas and the fifth area on legislation, I want to turn it over to my European colleagues to, to discuss. But the first is, is education. And this has a lot to do with, with media literacy uh, in, the, in the US. And this is not something that's going to happen overnight, but maybe we can you know, speed roll it um, mm -hmm. in the next year. So in the US, uh, education is actually controlled by the states. So it's actually the state legislatures that you engage with on an educational curriculum. And what would it look like to put a media literacy, you know, course with a, within a broader civics education, which we actually still don't have, you know, civics education anymore, which is another topic, um, to, to train young people on, on what is true, you know, what is not, before they republish something, before they become publishers, do they know that this is actually a verified source? So that's that's one thing. The other the other piece too is we had there was an interesting Pew resort re, uh, Pew uh, survey that came out a couple of years ago actually showing that it was older Americans that were more likely to um, share fake news. But you know we'll have to think of educational tools for them as well. The, in addition to education, specifically with anti-Semitism, Daniel, I think there's still a big misunderstanding in the general non-Jewish. Um, American public about what anti-Semitism is and what it's not. And that's something AJC is trying, is addressing right now. We've published an online glossary called um, Translate Hate that deals with the memes and the conspiracy theories and, you know, these various charges that occur online to try to educate predominantly actually non-Jewish audiences. I mean, ideally the human monitors of Facebook would actually be able to look at this and, and have more, a sense, a better sense of that educational sense of, of what's going on. So education's one, reporting is another, I mean, we're, Called to be, you know, we need to be engaged citizens or netizens, if you will, to, to report what we what we see. Uh, counter speech is a big one here. I mean, in the United States, we, we the, the First Amendment in many ways is sacrosanct, the freedom of expression, right? The freedom of belief, the freedom to assemble. These freedoms are dear to Americans. So a lot of a big argument, it's not perfect, but um, another best practice is the counter speech one where you are, you know, more offering more speech, having that that debate online. There's limits to that. I think women and minorities have a less of an equal opportunity on those platforms to actually engage equally. So, you know, that's one thing to, to consider. And then there's also the, the coalitions with the tech companies themselves. 
and you mentioned that I you know, came from the US government. Now I'm working for a civil society organization. I, I haven't worked at a tech company yet. Um, who knows, maybe one day, but it, it's important that all three of those actors, government, civil society, tech companies, and individuals work together because they'll actually be able to move, move the, needle, the, the needle more on, on these issues. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll, I'll stop there. Um, right. Maybe one of my panelists want to talk about censorship or takedown um, and legislation, which we have more of an issue here in the United States. All right. Uh, thank you, Ollie. And, and Nikita came back uh, just in the nick of time. Um, and Nikita, um, you specialize on radicalization, extremism, and terrorism at the Henry Jackson Society in London. Uh, what are some of the mechanisms uh, involved in radicalizing usually young people? And, and what is the particular appeal and danger of conspiracy theories in this context? Sure. So thank you so much for having me today. Um, it's such an honor to be on your panel and apologies for some of these technical issues. I've managed to hotspot with my phone. So I'll try and answer these questions while I'm, I'm still good. Um, so I just wanted to pick up on, on some things we were talking about earlier um, and the work that I do. Uh, I look very much at court cases. Um, the last report I did, uh, which was made possible through um, funding from Facebook, looked at what platform some of these young people are using, not young, I'm just generally people in the UK are using over the last five years, and what kind of convictions they were getting um, in the real world as a result of that. And one of the really interesting things I found was this difference between um, hate crime legislation, which is what is ordinarily used uh, in the United Kingdom for anti-Semitic hatred um, and anti-Semitic violence um, in the real world, and terrorism legislation. So if the person was uh, posting uh, anti-Semitic content uh, related to Islamic State or a group that was prescribed, obviously the amount of time they were getting in prison was far longer. So in fact, these uh, people who were affiliated with far right groups uh, were getting um, lower, lower sentences, which was extremely problematic. And, and following the release of this research uh, in February, um, the Home Office in the UK uh, prescribed two new uh, far-right organizations to kind of level the playing field. But something we definitely see in this research um, and links to uh, conspiracy theories um, is this, this general um, hatred of Jews across the um, extremist uh, spectrum. So it doesn't matter if you are far-right, Islamist, far-left, the one thing that they have in common is this extreme anti-Semitism. Uh, and I often wonder why that is, um, especially when we look at conspiracy theories and, you know, people's opinions on this. I watch a lot of this stuff um, on a daily basis as part of my job. Um, to me, it seems it comes from a sense of uncertainty. I'm not trying to obviously justify this hatred, but looking at the terrorism convictions and some of the material these people have released, when there is uncertainty, as there has been uh, with the COVID pandemic, uh, people increasingly go online to try to explain why this is that has happened. Uh, what we're beginning to see a lot of is a lot of health misinformation, a lot of um, anti-Asian sentiment, and a lot of blaming, um, you know, of Jewish people uh, for somehow creating this virus. And my fear is that that will actually increase um, because of unemployment, because of this threat of a recession, we have a lot of people at home now looking at this material because they're at home and under lockdown, but we will eventually have uh, people with grievances or, you know, who have been fired from their jobs, sitting at home, trying to look for material. And that again, takes me to this aspect of radicalization. So, you know, with terrorist organizations, traditionally, we would see some kind of buy-in from a central group. So whether that was Al Qaeda or the Taliban, there was a long process of whether, um, you know, ordinarily younger people uh, interacting with a recruiter, wanting to go abroad, training in a camp. But, you know, with the reduction of the power of Islamic State, we're beginning to see a lot of lone wolf or self-starter terrorists and often what I would call quite, uh, you know, almost to, almost to the point of being quite, you know, losers is, is a way to look at it. Those lonely people, you know, kind of like lonely people um, from certain areas uh, back of beyond, uh, maybe don't have good economic or 
um, you know, a good econ economic or employment prospects, going online and, and finding this material with no investment from a central group, no investment from a terrorist organization. And that often culminates in, um, in hate crime uh, in the real world. But where we do have, um, you know, uh, this, this idea of things in common is these conspiracy theories, is this anti-Semitism and this act of uh, perhaps going into the real world and committing an act, act of violence, which is what we really want to prevent. Mm -hmm. um, yes. Uh, thank you, Nikita. Uh, I just want to alert people. I, I'm getting some uh, alerts that my internet connection is unstable just in case I disappear. Then maybe Ali, you will uh, take over for the rest of uh, the panel. I hope everything stays stable. And with that, Perhaps this is a good good point to actually uh, turn it over to Ali for some questions from uh, our uh, worldwide audience. Sure, thank you so much, Daniel. I just wanna remind our audience that if you have a question for our panel, you can use the Q&A feature in Zoom or you can email questions, that's questions plural at ajc.org. Our first question is from Casey in London and I'll pose this to you, Katerina. How do we balance the overwhelming focus on the coronavirus and the desire to address anti-Semitism and other forms of hatred? Is there room to make real progress on these issues at this time when everyone's attention is diverted? Um, yes, that is indeed a challenge as it is so, with so many other policies that are in general very important but uh, seem to be on hold at the moment. However, I think that uh, when it as we already discussed and as Nikita also just um, explained again, there is an issue between the conspiracy myths that we see online and the um, effect it can have in the real world with hate crime uh, coming out of uh, conspiratorial convictions. And so I, um, I do think that within the European setup, we will look increasingly also at uh, these aspects of, uh, on, of conspiracy myths and how to uh, address them because um, you know we have um, regulations that request takedown of hate speech when, in, when it incites to violence which often conspiracy theories don't do directly so we have to find other ways of how to tackle this um, through fact finders through also um, placing correct information in uh, very quickly so it can be uh, there can be counter speech uh, in almost real time these kind of things are very challenging but need to happen and so i think that where while we are learning a lot in the digital uh, world now um, because we spend so much more time uh, in it um, i think that this will be one as aspect of it where we can actually profit from it. However, this doesn't mean, unfortunately, that all the anti-Semitic uh, ideas that are out there will certainly will suddenly disappear. Uh, Daniel, if I may just add one thing to Katharina, um, you know, it's our work's been made more challenging, right, to really combat anti-Semitism on the ground and we're all online. But there are things that we're actually still doing, like the work doesn't stop. Even though in the United States, we know that most of the anti-Semitism in the last two months have been online. There's been an uptick online. Um, those incidents are still happening offline as well. And we had some van we had issues of vandalism of synagogues in Huntsville, Alabama, about a mile from where I am right now in West Los Angeles, a synagogue was vandalized. And so it's just a reminder that, I mean, for instance, AJC, we're promoting um, for U the US Congress to pass legislation called the No Hate Act, which would improve hate crime reporting. And so this is happening. You know, the pandemic's happening, we're all inside, but we're still moving on these issues because we have to look past the pandemic and hopefully have those, that legislation in place for, for tomorrow. And maybe I can also add one other thing. Uh, Daniel, just uh, quickly, just to say that because we know um, of the impact it has also on extremism, we are now launching a study uh, on the research of extremist networks online. So, um, you know, I'm not sure whether it would have happened immediately at this uh, point in time, but uh, we are now signing the contract to ensure that we, are, that we know better how these networks actually act. Great, thank you so much. Our next question comes from Barbara from New Hampshire, and this is to Holly. 
Holly, we are seeing protests in U.S. state capitals against coronavirus public health measures. At some of these protests, we've seen Nazi imagery and other anti-Semitic signs and placards. Do we know of any links between these demonstrations and organized white nationalist organizations? That's a great question. It actually speaks to even what I was saying earlier that what we're seeing online is just staying online. It's, it's coming offline as well. And so just for um, our audiences from other places besides the United States, I'll just give a little bit of a background. Um, we've had some, um, you know, governors are actually taking the COVID-19 pandemic into their own hands and dictating what their state can and cannot do. And we've had several protests kind of erupt. Many of them are right-wing protests. Um, I don't want to say they're all neo-fascists or, or white supremacists. There are those members in those protests, um, but against those stay-at-home orders, really saying this is my, are my right to assemble, my right to, to worship, my right to, to, be, to be with other people less than six feet. And so we're seeing that, that, that protest, and we have had incidences where there's been anti-Semitic signs um, connecting, again, uh, Israel, Jews with the, the coronavirus. So, you know, I know that there are at least of a, of a couple of cases, one in Columbus, Ohio, where there was a link to a, a white supremacist group. Um, but other than that, I don't think that we've tracked like those people that were holding those signs with any other um, with any other groups. And I, I will say one thing, which is which is interesting because it um, kind of comes up with this idea of of when you say something anti-Semitic, are you automatically you know promoting promoting violence? Um, I saw that question also in in the chat and. It's a really hard topic here in the United States because people have the freedom to do that in public spaces. Like they're at the governor's house or at the, at the um, state capitol. They can legally march and have those signs and, and, and do that. And so it again is that civil society uh, mechanism, that pushback that we need to enact. Great. Our next question comes from um, Bob Hernig in Los Angeles. And Bob notes that Nikita, your work is focused on the propagation of extremist material online and that your research has put forward a number of solutions to foster engagement between the UK government and technology companies. What are some of those specific solutions? Sure. So as a think tank, uh, we are not affiliated with government or with um, private sector companies, and that allows us to do research uh, freely. The report that I mentioned uh, was funded by Facebook, still criticized Facebook as the number one platform that many of these extremists were using to direct their followers to what we call old tech platforms, mm -hmm. uh, Telegram, 8chan, and uh, other areas where it's much more difficult to monitor this kind of material. So to give two, two examples, the first would be this idea um, that neo-Nazi imagery and uh, white supremacism deserves to be designated um, as, as terrorism because it is that serious. It's not hate crime. Uh, it's not an opinion against a certain category of people. It's actually looking to enact violence um, and often eradicate an entire uh, group of people. It's very serious and it has a political objective. And as a result, it deserves to be designated. And designating a group allows us allows the government uh, to do things like sanction to look at financing um, allows technology companies to immediately remove things there's no room for error um, because it's extremism or gray area it is terrorism and it doesn't need to be on the platform so one example would be um, you know doing research that uh, kind of help the government recognize this gap and uh, designate two groups uh, in the united kingdom uh, far-right neo-nazi groups as terrorist organizations in February. And a second example, working directly with tech companies, we do a lot of work with YouTube and we have done so for a number of years as trusted flaggers. And we were flagging anti-Semitism for some time in the extremist videos we were seeking. And this goes into um, Holly's point earlier about private sector companies having a wider remit of making choices of what they allow on their platforms and what they don't. And we've gone from a stage few years ago where these uh, tech companies were saying things like, you know, we're a library. We don't know what books are in the library. We just host the books to now having a much more active uh, process in that. So we were flagging this anti-Semitic uh, material and now Holocaust denial on YouTube is not allowed. Um, so that is a great uh, win for, for us and other, com other um, think tanks and organizations in the UK and the US that have advocated for that. 
But unfortunately, where there's a will, there's a way. And what we're beginning to find in YouTube now is rather than Holocaust, uh, Holocaust denial, you're having wrong figures and, and reducing the impact of the Holocaust and allowing those videos to stay up because they don't technically violate the rules. So while we've done some work, I'd by no means say that the problem is solved or even close to being solved uh, in any of these agreements. Great. Our next question is to you, Katerina, from Executive Council Member Melanie Nelkin in Atlanta. Um, is there a particular agreement with social media platforms that the EU has been able to take down incitement or hate speech from these platforms? Is it done through their platforms or can governments uh, intervene or even users online intervene? And have you had any resistance in removing any of this speech from social media platforms? Yes, indeed. In uh, 2016, um, we concluded a code of conduct with all the major platforms and many more have joined since, whereby they uh, commit within, to, within 24 hours, uh, remove illegal hate speech that is flagged to them. Uh, which means that if users or professional NGOs like trusted flaggers um, uh, raise uh, issues with the platforms, the platform has a uh, committed to looking at this. So many platforms have actually, as a result of this, increased their capacity and uh, the, the number of lawyers that look at this uh, legislation um, uh, and uh, the implementation of that legislation on the platforms because um, it is important that the, that the platforms know the European legislation on which it is based, but also within Europe, the uh, legislation which may be added to, to that because, in, for example, Holocaust denial is criminalized across Europe, but also Holocaust distortion, which means that uh, as, as, a, as a fact checker on a, uh, of a platform, you actually need to know uh, how Holocaust distortion can uh, express uh, itself. So this, uh, this uh, flagging is open, of course, to every individual user and we very much encourage people to flag because uh, it means that, uh, you know, the platforms actually have an obligation to uh, look into it. We know that by far not uh, enough is uh, removed, but what is illegal offline is also illegal online and it is on that premises that this uh, code of conduct was uh, created we've seen significant improvement um, in the beginning only about 28 percent of content was actually looked at and uh, a very small figure was uh, removed now we're at a removal rate of 72 percent which given that not everything that is flagged is actually illegal uh, is not is not bad but it concerns only the flagged content. And so I think we have to be realistic to see that hate speech nowadays is created by algorithms, by fake accounts, and there are many other sources that can be very effective in multiplying hate speech in a, in a way that uh, the, the, the normal user cannot even uh, keep up with. And so this is something that we will have to look into within the European Digital Service Act and the president, the new president von der Leyen of the European Commission has actually in her speech in the parliament said that this will be part of um, the Digital uh, Service Act to see in how far uh, illegal hate speech can be dealt with in a more effective way. Can I step in here, uh, Ali, just for uh, one moment also because my internet connection is very unstable, so maybe this was, might be my last word. Um, I just want to come back to the issue of conspiracy theories. I personally usually come out more on the side of uh, free speech uh, when in doubt. Um, but um, I believe that conspiracy theory ought to be looked at more as a form of, as a very radical form of incitement to, to violence. Because if you look at it, if you, uh, if you claim and actually believe that a specific group, Jews, be it other minorities, are really responsible, let's take the specific case of, of, the, uh, of this pandemic, it's really that the Jews have really created this virus to uh, kill people and to oppress the world and to profit the world. I mean, this is such a demonization. Um, mm -hmm. If you really believe that Jews are so evil, it almost automatically follows that you have to resort, uh, resort to violence. I mean, this is the reason 
why conspiracy theory so often have been employed by, uh, by uh, totalitarian regimes to then um, uh, 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 justify the violence, be it actually the Holocaust or in the Middle Ages, the blood libels, uh, and there could be other examples. So would it not be time to sort of take another look at this very specific example of hate speech and, and, and recategorize it? You're talking okay. to me? Yes, okay. Well, I mean, well, you know, I mean, we have to we have to see what the legal basis is and whether whether this is possible. I think it would be a bit off the cuff to uh, give an opinion on this. Certainly, I think uh, where also the the approach is shifting is to look at conspiracy myths uh, much more as a source for for violence, as as you said, and and the. Uh, uh, and something that has real power on people's minds that can then uh, end in uh, hateful uh, acts and hate crime. And, and that uh, connection, uh, I, I believe that, for example, within uh, the um, uh, research that we will be conducting now uh, on uh, right-wing extremist networks online will certainly be a topic. Daniel, I'll, I'll say something about conspiracy theories real quickly in the, the United States, because I know uh, that I, conspiracy theories, as long as they don't incite violence, like actual violence in the text, like they won't be taken down because of, of the First Amendment. The first thing we should know, and even as Americans like today, before COVID, 50% of Americans believe in at least one conspiracy theory. Okay, so you know this is this is Bigfoot. This is the anti-vaxxers. This is 9/11. You know what happened there? Who shot JFK? Um, do we really land on the moon? Like these types of conspiracy theories um, are believed by by some Americans. And actually, when you this is, this goes to an interesting question, which maybe we can get into, is what are the unintended what are the unintended consequences of takedown? Um, actually, people who have their material taken down that adds to their conspir the, the conspiratorial mm. belief that someone is in control, someone's against them, someone's taking down their content. And it actually almost galvanizes them even more to continue to push this, this out or it just goes underground and, 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 and continues. So it's, it's very complicated, um, especially here in, in the United States. Our next question is uh, for you, Holly, and it's from Morris in Westchester. Um, not all anti-Semitic conversations are online. Some strongly respected newspapers have implied that the Haredi or ultra-Orthodox communities in the United States were responsible for the spread of the virus. While these outlets look at other groups with high disease and death rates um, with sympathy, uh, not, not, it is not true for the ultra-Orthodox community. What can be done about this? That's a good question. Um, as, as thank you, Morris, for it. And as, as you might know, and our, our listeners and viewers might know, that the, the Haredi and, and um, the ultra Orthodox communities are the most visible, visibly Jewish communities that we have in the United States. And they have been recipients of, of countless anti Semitic attacks because of that, um, especially this past Hanukkah, um, which we saw in Monzi and other places as well. It's, you know, it is problematic. It, it's definitely problematic. And, you know, we, we do know that. There, there was a little bit of a disconnect, right, between what the health, like the, um, you know, health practitioners and the governor and then the mayor were saying for, about social distancing. You know, we know Haredi weddings still happen and funerals still happen that, that had some challenges, right, with law enforcement versus, you know, what was, what was happening. But there has been movement and, and now they are, they are following um, that. We need to speak out against it. If we feel like um, one community is being treated in a way that's, that's inappropriate or maybe more so focused on the like, Haredi community, we should comment. Or what about these other communities as well, and and not and not encourage that type of um, that type of belief toward them? I think that um, links back to the previous question, which um, I, I kind of wanted to comment on. On um, you, know, you have carrot and stick. So when we're looking at conspiracy theories, you can certainly approach it from a from a stick point of view that you know we have to remove all of this and uh, it's not acceptable. But uh, as Holly said, unfortunately, you know. They will, they will crop up in different ways. And we also have to be careful between um, state actors and non-state actors. It's all very well if your ordinary Joe is saying something silly on the internet, but when actual political leaders, of which there are many who unfortunately do share a lot of anti-Semitic material, 
they will fuel the, fa the, the, they will fuel the fire and they will have many, many more followers. So where does the onus then lie if we then make that illegal? Um, is it, is it actually, actually enforceable if leaders of countries are, are saying these things and retweeting people, for example, who share these beliefs on Twitter? Um, it's very unfortunate, but it is, it is happening. Thank you. And we'll take um, one last question, uh, which I hopefully will leave us on a slightly more positive note. Um, and I'll start with you, Nikita, but I'd really like to hear all three of your perspectives and maybe even from you, Daniel. It seems that many of us in this, oh, I'm sorry, by the way, this question is from Dale in Chicago. Um, many of us feel helpless and powerless when it comes to combating anti-Semitism and hate speech more broadly. If you had to make one recommendation to our audience, that they something that they could do to help, what would it be? So, so my recommendation would be, you know, to be strong and and keep flagging this, keep having the counter narratives, keep engaging. It is it is incredibly sad, but it in some ways it reminds me of terrorism. When when a terrorist attack happens, it is to scare and intimidate the public. It is try, to try to stop you from going out and and going to you know, heavily populated areas because something bad could happen. And of course, bad things do happen, but we have to be strong and vigilant and uh, you know, have this kind of sol solidarity uh, with each other and, and continue to combat it. I know it can be exhausting. There's definitely exhaustion when it comes uh, to terrorism as well, but unfortunately, there are bad actors everywhere and we can't give in to them and give them what they want. Um, I agree, Nikita. I'll just pick up with what you said. One thing that I recommend, and especially for Americans, is 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 the counter speech, but is providing the educational material. I don't think we should go down rabbit holes with with anti semites who can't be moved. It's the people on the fence that are watching the public debate happen in this marketplace of ideas, which are these online platforms. Like, can we provide the material? Can we provide something like Translate Hate that AJC created, or other tools to help educate them? That's the first piece. But this is the, the maybe it's the, the optimist in me or the American um, in me, is that we have seen improvement. If we look at just 10 years ago, where we were in this space, like there's it's leaps and bounds of what tech companies have been able to respond to, what they're doing now. Um, I mean, Twitter has banned virulent white supremacist accounts. They actually find, they finally, and Nikita would know this, when they suspended ISIS accounts, we know that it actually severely affected the Islamic State's ability to develop and maintain um, robust and influential communities on, on Twitter. So Facebook's responding, Reddit's responding, um, white supremacists have now been kicked off of Airbnb and OkCupid. Um, so there is this movement. It's just, you know, we're, we're in the middle of it right now and we can't, and we can't stop. The last thing I'll just say too is, is the proactivity of some of these um, platforms. It's not just reactive and takedown and, and monitoring. Um, it's, it's being proactive. It's, it's, it's having these redirect channels. So if you Google, how do I join ISIS? Google, you know, a specialist are, are, are um, redirecting. And what you, you see in front of you is, is anti-ISIS, like, you know, talking you out of joining ISIS. And that's being proactive actually as the tech companies. And we did not see that, um, you know, five, six, seven years ago. Yes, I think it's a question of attitude also. Um, uh, I had the honor to, of being at the 75th anniversary uh, in, uh, of the liberation of Auschwitz um, uh, earlier this year. And uh, Marian Tulski, a uh, Holocaust survivor who had, he was taken to Auschwitz at the age of 18, he said that there was one amendment that he would add to the 10 uh, com commandments um, and he said, as the 11th commandment, thou shalt not be indifferent. And I think uh, this is something that it doesn't apply just to the online world. Of course, we, uh, we've talked a lot, a lot about the online world, but in the end, it's about uh, this attitude to say, when I see something that is unjust um, around me in my neighborhood, um, of course, it concerns anti-Semitism, it can concern any form of injustice, I speak up. And uh, if we have that kind of attitude, it will automatically, I think, lead to us um, speaking up uh, online, but also offline, and therefore also lead to action. That, and I think, especially if we look at the current pandemic, the acts of solidarity that we have seen actually are very positive um, um, uh, reaction and outcome uh, of this uh, crisis. 
And if we can keep that beyond the crisis, I think uh, we, can, um, we can actually move society uh, forward. And let's not forget the extremists the are not that many. Let me, let me add my, uh, my two cents. I, I underline everything that has been said. I think a lot has to do with, uh, with your attitude. Uh, and I think everything uh, and standing up uh, for the rights of others and your own rights uh, is very important. Be it as simple as a tweet that counts as counter speech, responding to something you see on Facebook, uh, standing up and if you overhear somebody in the subway or on the shop, uh, who says something racist or anti-Semitic. Um, and there's strength in numbers. Uh, join a good organization that does excellent work. Um, those of you here on the call who uh, are new to AJC uh, may, uh, may want to check us out. Um, and uh, and uh, if, we are, if we work together, we can achieve so much more. Um, thank you so much, Katarina, Nikita, and Oli. This was an excellent panel. Uh, it was really my honor to be the, the quota man here. Uh, I, I'm looking forward to uh, working with all of you uh, on these important issues. Thank you for your time, and thank you, uh, all, all our viewers from around the world, uh, for, for your interest, and hope to see you soon on another uh, AJC program. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, panel. That was a terrific discussion. Thanks as well to our audience for joining today and to our partners at Jewish Insider. To support the vital work of AJC, please visit ajc.org backslash donate. Please stay safe and healthy, everyone. Good day.